Here you loud and oh. clear. <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. Um, dear Lord, thank you for this group of people who was able to come. Uh, we pray for the people who were not able to come um, due to other obligations and life's complications, and for uh, people who might be watching on Twitch or view the recording later, that your word would bless them and that they would hear uh, what they need to hear today and that you would meet them where they are. In your mercy, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. I appreciate that. So we are in a, what was a, a supposed to be just one uh, section, ended up becoming a two-parter from last week. So um, like I said, we I only have for tonight, because this is technically part two of the study I did two weeks ago, or that we did, sorry, that we did together as a group two weeks ago. Um, and I only really have four verses, or I'm sorry, five to cover and go over. Uh, which is Luke chapter 12, uh, verses 8 through 12. So, I guess, without further ado, we can just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, can I get someone to read Luke chapter 12, verses 8 through 12? I'll take it. Go for it. Thanks, Frida. One second, let me turn off my fan. Okay. Uh, starting in verse 8 through 12 through... Oh, it's listed. Okay, never mind. <laughs> yep, go for it. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. All right. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, this, this one's a whopper. This is why we did a part two mm -hmm. for this, because this is a this is a. There's a lot of just, I, I'm hoping, I'd love to hear your guys' input on this, and I want you guys to feel free to express your opinions. Because I'm facilitating this, I've when I was studying this part of Scripture, I was very worried about misrepresent because, you know, they say that, you know, there's a lot more, I guess, as since I was leading the Bible study, there's a lot more, um, how should I say, intimidation as in i don't want to speak heresy or lead someone wrong here like that but i would love to hear your opinions all on it for for me personally and we'll get into it as we go through the study i tried my hardest to just see what does scripture say about it and i'd also like to encourage you guys if um you guys have scripture like i want you to share your opinions i want you to feel free to share your opinions but if you have scripture to back up your opinion with, that's what is the most important to me because like uh, they, we say here often, scripture is the greatest commentary on itself or the best way to, to interpret scripture is with scripture. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, diving in, the, the question that I have for you guys tonight, well, let, let's, let's, let's break this down. We got time. I mean, it's only five verses. So if we look at verse eight, it says, and I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the son of man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So I didn't really have a question about that when I was studying over this verse. If you guys have some questions about that, maybe we can dig in and look into it. For me, it seemed pretty uh, self-explanatory. I mean, if we're if we deny Christ, you know, Christ said that again, He'll deny us before uh, the angels of God. Although I know that. Oh, go ahead, scribe. I'm fine. Go ahead. Okay, um, but then we have an example of like Peter, who he denied Christ three times, um, and yet he, you know, Christ, he's the rock, or Peter, or Jesus called him, he'd be um, the rock in which he would build his church upon. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. No, no, I'll, we'll, we'll ring back to that. You go ahead. No, I'm, I'm done. Go for it. I'll, I'll just say Peter is not the rock on which Christ built the church. Okay, go for it. That is 
that's that's Greek. What Jesus, when he uses the term rock there, he's doing a play on words. He uses the word, when he renames Peter, he uses the term Petros, which means a little pebble. Okay. But uh, when he says, upon this rock, I will build my church, he uses a different word, Petra, which means, you know, giant boulder. What Jesus is building on isn't Peter, but the reality which Peter expresses that Jesus is the Christ. Yes. Perfect. All right. My, I, like I said, I appreciate you guys' input. Um, Mm -hmm. So thank you. I appreciate you clearing that up. Um, Anything else you guys wanted to add about verses 8 and 9 before we jump uh, into 10? Because that was the one that I really had a question about, and that's the one that I did a lot of studying on. So uh, anything else you guys want to bring up here? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, uh, Kessler. I'm still forming my thought. Go ahead. (laughs) Thanks. Um, I was just going to say, I think that verses 8 through... Oh, it's just 8 through 9. I think that those ones are greatly misinterpreted by a lot of people. Like, I've seen many teachers take a very legalistic stance with that, and they tend to forget, like you were saying, that Peter also denied Christ, but, like, um, he isn't necessarily condemned by that, because I think that it's a lot more... um, the type of rejection that Christ is talking about here is much more um, deliberate and like intentional and more of like a rejection of him, like as your savior, like as a whole completely. Okay. Hmm. Oh, I'll get back to you. I want to look something up. Sure, take your time. Like I said, this is this is it for tonight. So anything you guys want. Also, to share? also just for what it's worth, um, we have time. It's only five verses. Are quite possibly going to be your last words. Take it from someone who's been there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought um, that when I saw verse ten, we might be there all night. <laughs> right. To kind of add to what I was saying too, because I didn't yes, like please. fully formulate it. Um. I think a lot of what Jesus is calling out here especially is like the lukewarm Christian, specifically people who are like playing church. So it's like, you know, they kind of have this double life. They say on one hand they believe, but then like on the other hand, you know, when um, the persecution and the actual um, so-called consequences the world will bring when we claim Christ, when those come around they tend to just like be blown away by the wind i think there's a verse on that it's like something like they're tossed to and fro or something like that i think say hello to the book of james (laughs) yeah so i that's kind of my interpretation there okay excellent i appreciate you sharing yeah for sure Oh my gosh. Okay, so that's amazing. I guess, so I guess then, uh, while we're waiting for people to gather uh, the thoughts... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Scribe. I've got my insight. So the idea of <clears throat> verses 8 and 9, where it's, you know, whoever confesses me before... And I will confess him before the angels, but whoever, you know, denies me, I will deny him before the angels. The word confess there, the same word used in the original language as the word confess in Romans 10, 9. Okay. Which is, uh, if you believe in your heart that God has raised him, that, you know, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Same word. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) The word is a homologeo. Uh, uh. Well, that's interesting. That is interesting because that does that will actually tie into verse ten. I put right? that in the wrong channel. I'm sorry. Bad subscribe. Wait, let me get a screenshot. They're already gone. Darn it. There you go.
So admittedly here it actually has, in this verse it has a, a modifier. And what do you mean by that? Well, it, it, the word confess here, it, it's a homologeo, but it also has a Greek, like a, think of it like a, um, uh, like a prefix. Okay. On it. So it's en homologeo, uh, and, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so it's a, it's more of a matter of a, that being in a place of that. So it's not this. Whereas in in uh, Romans ten nine, as I understand it, it is this confession with your mouth. Although I I want to look it up now, but uh, in homologeo, what it means is not a one time confession. It is a continual confession. It's repeat. It's something that is lived out. You are in a state of confessing. Is essentially oh, the idea here. I see. Does the homo on there? Does that mean man? Am I correct? And um, no, 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 no. That's uh, homo. In that case, would be would be Latin. Uh, the homo from Greek means one. Oh, okay. Mm, okay. So homo logeo. So it, it it logeo. You may recognize that you know being related word. to the Greek word logos. Yeah, word. So homo meaning one, and logos meaning word. One word. In other words, a being, consistent being, confession. Yes, it's being in unison with something. It, 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 it's it's admitting your your uh, your you, you being in alignment in you know if we're gonna you know go acts you know being in one in one accord with something homogenous <laughs> I was gonna say you if you want if you want to play the game with milk yeah go for it homogenize milk Gosh. Uh, let's see where is Okay, there's my thought. Um, uh, I apologize for holding things up. No. If I was. Nope, you were not. Okay, yep. So, real, real quick, uh, the confess in Romans 10.9 is strictly, uh, it, it doesn't have the, uh, the modifier. It doesn't have that prefix. That's really interesting and good. But it, but it is the same word. Mm, okay. So it's like Romans 10.9 is a one is an initial event that sets everything up, and then back in Luke 12 is the expression of a life lived in that in in a manner. So like Romans starts the process, Luke 12 is what continues after that. I see. Okay. This is why we have the statement that the Bible is the greatest commentary on itself. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to read what Kessler wrote here. Uh, people who are watching, it's Christ, Kessler wrote, Christ seems to be using a pattern of comparing temporal consequences with eternal consequences in such a way that by comparison, the temporal consequences are of no consequence. So, is there anything you'd like to elaborate on that, Kess? Because I'm basically, or do you want me to try to take a shot at what you're trying to say here? <laughs> um. Christ keeps, um, he's acknowledging what will happen when people are faithful. Um, like in the previous study, it was, I warn you whom to fear, fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Um, yeah. After saying, don't fear those who can kill the body, he doesn't say they won't kill the body, they can't kill the body, that it won't be painful, but he just says, by comparison, um, the alternative is much worse. And the same in this paragraph tonight Oops. here's a fun thought uh, in the realm of continual confession here on earth is reflected with continual confession of Christ before the angels does that remind you of anybody if you ask me that sounds an awful lot like Job yeah you're right uh, can in you... what aspect? Yeah, that's. I was wondering if you could elaborate uh, on that because I don't know. Well, exactly Jesus, we 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 have we have the tale of you know the testimony of Job, his actions that he would continually make sacrifices to God, and he would make sacrifices on behalf of his family for sins that maybe they've never even confessed about, constantly 
offering up his devotion to God. And whenever Satan shows up to accuse, uh, Satan shows up in heaven, God's like, hey, have you seen Job? He's my, he's my servant. That, guy, <laughs> that guy's awesome. And so we see, you know, that's, that's active evidence. It very laid out in the, in the story of Job, the reflection of Jesus's words here. If you confess and reflect in your life a devotion to me, to God, for Job, then I will, you know, reflect my devotion to you before the angels, which we very clearly see. <laughs> mm -hmm. Makes sense. Put that together. That's a really good point, though. I'm really tempted to just wait for a moment where Kess's internet or somebody's internet drops out for like a real quick minute. And then they come back like 10 seconds later. And once they reconnect, I'll just say, and that's why the Bible doesn't make any sense. You <laughs> jerk. <laughs> All right. Well, if anyone has anything else to add about verses 8 and 9, if not, we can go ahead and we can jump right into verse 10. Nothing else? Go once? Go twice? All right. So in verse 10, it says here that, And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Um, mm. So my question for you guys tonight, and this was the big one, is uh, what is blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Um, I've heard some pastors and theologians refer to it as the unpardonable sin. Uh, before I get your answers about it, there are some verses that I wanted to read that have to, uh, that supposedly, and I'd like to get your uh, interpretations on this. Real quick, before you go too far, did anybody else do their homework? Yes. Oh, Maddie did her homework. Yay. Yes. I, this is a topic I have talked hours about. It's really, oh. really Settle yes. in. You might be talking for it for hours again tonight. <laughs> <laughs> this is also one that I have read repeatedly and had discussions about repeatedly across multiple Bible studies. So awesome! I well, I'm like looking it. forward to what you guys have to share. <gasps> yeah. Um, Sorry, so I just realized that my my concordance app on my phone has a dark mode. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> so, uh. Just real quickly, I want to read some verses that people tend to use when they're talking about, or like theologians will talk about the unpardonable sin. So we'll just go ahead and we'll start with uh, the first gospel, Matthew. Uh, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 30 through 32, I'm going to read from the ESV. It says, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven and whoever speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven but whoever speaks against the holy spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come uh, another verse that people point to when referring to this is in mark chapter 3 verses 28 through 30 um, it says truly i say to you all sin will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. This when That last part, verse 30, it says, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. I wanted to point out that's the Pharisees that were saying this to Jesus, that he had an unclean spirit. So mm -hmm. um, then we can go to Hebrews. We look at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, it says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Uh, in Hebrews again, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31, it says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, 
there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And if we jump to, this will be, let me double check. Yep, this will be the last verse that I wanted to read before we jump into discussion about this. It says in 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 through 19, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, sorry, the way that's worded is kind of funny, um, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protect, uh, protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. All right, so then that uh, begs the question, what is blasphemy in the Holy Spirit? And from here, I'm going to hand it over to you guys and see what you guys have to say based upon some of the verses that we've read. Uh, I guess I'll go first. Yes, um, please. So... What I have always understood it to mean is the only time in which you can no longer receive forgiveness is once you've once you've died. And so the unforgi unforgivable sin, this blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, is not accepting the gift that was willingly given to us and accepting um, Christ and accepting that. And the only reason... And at that point, you've died, and it's too late at that point. So that's what I've always understood it to be, is that that's why it's the only one that you can never recover from. Okay. Sort of a deal. Do you kind of follow where I'm, what I'm saying? Yep, yep, I know what you're saying. Um, but at that point, you had your whole life, you had your whole point to reach out to God. Yeah. And I guess, I guess my question towards that is um now i don't know because this this draws on different uh church backgrounds um but i i guess would you say then i don't know i don't want to open i don't, I, I i better be careful how i word this you can um <laughs> So you know how I, I can't quote I can't think of the scripture at the moment, but the one where it talks about, and I believe it's in John, where where it talks about how I ch you did not choose me, I chose you. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Is that in John? Uh -huh. Yeah. So I guess if someone dies, based upon what you said, if someone dies um, without accepting Christ, would you mean then that God never chose him? Like, is that because the way and I, I the way you had worded it, I, what I have written down here is that blessing of the Holy Spirit is when you basically experience your whole life and you choose to just reject God and that, that, that death is the final unforgivable sin. So, but then isn't it not God that is choosing us through the Holy Spirit? So, once again, I have to word this, this properly. Um, <laughs> um, so my personal belief on it is we are given free will, but God has, and God, yes, chooses us. And there are, because it even mentions in the Bible that are, there are some that he hardens their hearts. Like and Pharaoh. Yeah, yeah, like Pharaoh. Uh, and there's even, I believe there's multiple cases in the New Testament even, I can't even think of what it is, 
there were several, but there are a few locations in the New Testament, I believe, where uh, it says God hardened their hearts or Christ hardened their hearts or one of the two. Um, I mean, same thing. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's through that application, God, God is omniscient. He knows everything. And he knows that if this person, since he sees everything and knows all, if he knows that this person will never accept Christ or what he's done for them, mm -hmm. by hardening their heart is just to speed it along sort of a deal and use it for his purpose. Because okay. that is another thing is that whether you are for God or against God, God still uses you. It's yep. just probably not for your benefit if you're trying to go against him. Um, and so it's not the fact that we don't – so we do have free will. It's just he's omniscient. So it seems like – yeah, anyways. Um, I'm not going to get into that side of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think uh, we want to I, I, You're doing an excellent job. I really do appreciate what you mm -hmm. have to share. And I, I kind of put you on the spot there. And I, I even <laughs> I was like, oh, man, do I really want to go this direction? <laughs> but I was curious just because um, – that's just what popped in my head when you, when you, I guess when you gave your def the definition of what, when you, basically when you had said that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is basically you dying without accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so I threw that out there because that's what came to my mind. But then you handled it very, very well without completely rabbit trailing this whole thing. So thank you very <laughs> much. I'm like, I could, I can make us a uh, delay the last two verses for next week. Right, right. No. <laughs> Do it, make this a three parter thing. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> you, you handle it very well. I'm very impressed. Better than I could do. Anything else, guys? Yeah, I did have a take to add to this. Absolutely. I want to hear, I would love to hear everyone's take about this, to be honest. All right. Um, I'll try not to ramble too much. I just have some baseline. Uh, things I usually talk about with this but um, I think something important that I've seen a lot of like misinformation on especially with the I don't know why but the young Christian community like the teenagers have a lot of misinformation on the unforgivable sin which is pretty sad because it's it's um, I'll just explain it and then you'll listen. <laughs> yeah I um, actually am curious because I, I I don't really know what the, the younger generation has to say about this honestly what I work yeah, with doesn't even, uh -huh. doesn't even care about the bible so <laughs> <I would laughs> yeah <love> so <laughs> a lot of the like the newer belief or um the a lot of the beliefs that the teenage Christian community has about this right now is that this is like a sin that you can not only commit on accident but it's a sin that it's kind of like a one-and-done deal. Um, really? My personal interpretation on this is that um, the unforgivable sin is unforgivable because of the nature of the sin. So, like, somebody who commits the unforgivable sin is deliberately, at every point in their life, going out of their way to reject the Holy Spirit. Like... They're basically plowing God down, for lack of a better illustration here. Um, like, it's something that has to be, like, so intentional and repeated. And um, because of the nature of the sin, again, somebody who commits this isn't going to seek forgiveness anyways. So um, that would also heavily contribute to it not being forgivable as, like, they're rejecting the very being who sanctifies um, and has, like, such a huge role in salvation, essentially. So that's kind of my very condensed <laughs> thoughts. That is, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, because I've had a lot of, I've, the, the cliche I've heard over and over again is that if you worry, if you worry that you have committed the unforgivable sin, you haven't, because people who have, right. the, yeah. who have blasphemed the Holy Spirit they no longer really the, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a way of really touching their conscience. Like they're they have yeah. completely turned. They have instead of doing God's work, they've completely switched to wanting to do you know the work of Satan. Mm -hmm. Their um, hearts have been hardened. Their hearts Definitely. have been hardened exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting that you you run across young people who believe you can even do this by accident. That's yeah, I've never it's heard that bad. before. <laughs> and I think that may be because 
we live in a world where everything is so interconnected. They could be getting uh -huh. mixed signals from the Catholic Church that has True. a few sins on their thing that are considered. I can't name them, I, but they ha in their faith they have things that are like some the some of the sins that are listed as unforgivable sins. Yeah, I, like it's like one and done. It right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. To add on what you to what you two were saying, um, I definitely agree. I think like if somebody's like heart is at the point where like they're willing to like commit this um like dark and like terrible blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, like they're they're never going to seek him, period, to begin with at that point. Like it's just a downward spiral. So then I got a question for some of you guys here. Well, actually, I'll wait and see if someone else has something else to want to add, and then I have a question to add, ask you guys. Nothing? Okay. Um, based upon what Maddie and Freedom have said, have you guys, and I don't know, some of you guys have run across this situation, but if you were trying to witness to someone, and they had said, oh, I can never be saved. I can never go to heaven even way. Even if I did ask Jesus into my heart, I can never go to heaven. And, and you said, well, why, why is that? And you said, well, because I've committed the unforgivable sin. What would your response be to that person? Ooh. I think for me personally, I would definitely um, approach it with basing it off of the verse, um, I don't know where it is, so sorry, guys. But it's, um, Jesus says, he who comes to me, I will not cast out. So, like, mm -hmm. I would put the focus on if, you know, despite what you think you've done in the past, despite if you think you've committed this sin, like, if there is any part of you that yearns to have Christ or, like, even just slightly is curious to open that door, like, he will be right there. Like, he's mm -hmm. knocking on the door. All you have to do is open it. Excellent. And the fact that they've acknowledged that they know that they've committed it, or they think that they've committed it, at least leads to the idea that they have a conscience of the, right. of the issue at hand. They reckon they have the first. They recognize the first step of the Roman road, and that is that all have sinned and fallen short. They recognize yes. the need for a savior. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which that's the work of the Holy Spirit in itself. Because how many people do you run across who don't even believe in the concept of sin? Yeah, um, amen. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Kessler wrote here, uh, whosoever will may come. That's uh, Spurgeon's, res well, Spurgeon's response to that. Okay, awesome. Oh, Charles Spurgeon. That's a um, good right. If does anyone else want to share anything else about this? Because if not, then I was going to actually go to a different book of the Bible to try to see if we can answer this question. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. Favorite. Okay, so, um, what, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Freedom. Go for it. So, I did find the thing that I was referencing with the Catholic Church. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the subsides of, I think they've renounced this part of it, but it used to be in, like, their bylaws i guess you could call it but i think some of the catholic churches have reformed this away um but like murder torture um things related to children uh suicide all of those are all of those are considered to be unforgivable sins in their in this uh, sect of mm, the mm -hmm. i've heard that before because uh two of the guys that i work with they were actually both raised catholic and they had uh both of them have an instance of where either a family member or a friend had committed suicide, and so they were not allowed to be buried in a certain Aww. section of the cemetery with the other with their other generational family members because they, like they they act, it was like part of their law, like Catholic wow. doctrine, like you cannot be buried in this particular cemetery if you can with the rest of your family members if you had committed suicide. And I was just like, wow. It's, That's so it's rough. With, that, oh my with that thinking, it's generally because, okay, murder is a sin. 
Right. Okay. Well, you in the Catholic faith, you have to uh, you have to talk to the priest to get forgiven. Well, you can't right. do that if you've just killed yourself. And so that's why right. suicide in in a lot of these sects is uh, considered an unforgivable sin because you don't have a chance to repent for it. True. I do know that the um I have a good friend who's Catholic as well, and they definitely um they definitely have the belief of like you need to have everything like confess before you die and like if you don't then you're condemned by it essentially like christ's forgiveness doesn't transcend like whether or not we are able to confess one thing that i've always had a problem with that and uh i grew up or i went to high school in a heavily catholic populated area and no one could ever, none of them could ever really give me a good response on this from the Catholics' perspective. Mm -hmm. It was basically, what if, what if uh, a mute person commits a, commits a sin, and he can't uh, can't verbally confess it? Yeah. Does that mean he's just doomed to go to hell and he can never confess, and uh, he's just an irredeemable person? So pencil and paper is for man. <laughs> <laughs> and braille. Uh, <laughs> well, no, because the confessional is uh, blocked off and you're not supposed to see them, so how can oh, you... You're just going to slide yeah. it under, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> that it is just, interesting. It just... Yeah. If at any point in in your faith, if you're putting limits on God's power, you're wrong. So... Ooh. Yeah. And, yeah. Definitely. All right. Well, I will um, hold it there so I don't derail the. the... <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. Actually, you guys are doing awesome. Um, so I figure that since we're covering such a a topic as this, the best answer for it would obviously be scripture. And the scripture that I had stumbled across actually previously when I was doing this study, um, was Second Peter chapter two. Um. I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and I'll just read it. Okay. And then, uh, unless someone else wants to read it, I know Scribe has a beautiful reading voice. If he, <laughs> because I know he had done, he, he specifically texted me in direct message saying, I did my homework. So I don't want to take any joy away from Scribe right. if he wanted, since he specifically addressed me to say that he did his homework on this. So <laughs> is there something, would you like to read this, Scribe? And put your I am fine in. leaving it to someone else. Are you sure? Yeah. <gasps> okay. Anyone anyone want to read this chapter or would it be the whole thing? Up? Actually, I think all of chapter two is good. Well, I mean the whole Bible's good, but as far as for talking about what <laughs> yeah. we're talking about here, I think wow. that chapter two, the whole thing just just sentence after sentence seemed to apply. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, goodness, I couldn't I just ended up finished reading the rest of Second Peter, honestly. Um so, I mean, I could try to take that on. Um, maybe I could do like half of it, like to twelve. Sure, and then I'll take the other half. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Okay. Go for it. What yeah. All right. One more time. <laughs> it's Second Peter it. chapter two. Okay. <laughs> so she's gonna go to twelve, and then you you offered to finish it. All right. So Second Peter chapter two verses one. Um, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of the truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes, and made an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless for that righteous man living among them day after day 
was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from the trials and to hold the right to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on a sex- celestial beings, yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters that they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, revealing their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they will never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezir, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey an animal without speech who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water and mist driven by storm. Blackest darkness is reversed for them. They are mouth, they are for they mouth empty, boastful, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the fresh flesh, They entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people who, for people are slaves to do whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and and a sow that has is washed returns to her wallowing in mud. Excellent job, guys. Thank you so much. Of course. Wow, is that chapter chock full of information that is 100% applicable to everything we've... Oh my goodness. Mm. I almost had to stop halfway through that (laughs) and like take a breath and think, I need to write some of this stuff down. Like, (laughs) Verse 19, though, so relevant. Oh my goodness, that is the exact one that I was thinking of. (laughs) I I was reading that and I'm like, did y'all notice the pause after 20? I was thinking I would stop there and then mention something about it. Oh, my goodness. Well, go for it. Mention whatever oh that pause goodness. was. <laughs> Just, I've had yeah. so many talks with people recently regarding a lot of the stuff that's going on. And mm-hmm. and just people are just the the quote that it has in there for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Just yes. talking about how. We live in a society where freedom is all we claim to care about, pretty much. Like, we live in a society where we're always trying to fight for our freedoms, fight for our freedoms. But if you're fighting for the freedom to do something that you're you're dependent on, whether it be uh, (laughs) immoral pleasure or drug abuse or anything like that, you're not free. You're just a slave to something else. Yeah. And, oh, man, that, that hit. Wow. Oh, man. The Bible's cool, you know? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Uh, I've read this multiple times, and I still got a little, some goosebumps hearing you guys read it again. It's just, it's crazy. It's like, it's like going back and reading Romans 1 again. You're just like, man, yeah. everything that's going on in the world, it's like, it's so applicable. Sharper than any yeah. two-edged sword, for sure. Um, Comments, guys. 
I think that um, a lot of what we read here is really kind of like outlining um, that, you know, these people who the Bible speaks of, um, the traits here are referenced many other places where it says that, you know, essentially if people are practicing this kind of just like, for lack of a better term, like unhingedness, like mm -hmm. just spiritual unhingedness, um, right. they do not inherit the kingdom of God. And I think it's kind of, um, it's really doing a good job at illustrating like exactly what is going on with the kind of condition that is there in someone that commits the unforgivable sin. Yep. Some of the things that uh, jump out to me on here is uh, like you guys said, also verse 19 where it says well they promise liberty they themselves i'm reading on the new king james version but they say well they promised them liberty they themselves are slaves to corruption that was a big one um i was actually listening when i was studying this i was listening to a pastor who was talking about this very subject and he said something very interesting and it was another reason why i felt so compelled to read this whole chapter is he said have you ever wondered why the Holy Spirit has never tried to bring Satan or his demons to repentance. <laughs> and like, and you look right here, uh, where was that? Where it talks about even God. I think verse four. Verse four. Yes. For God who did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of the eight people, the preachers of righteousness bring to the flood or uh, bringing in the flood on the world for the ungodly and turning to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and to ashes condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterwards would live ungodly and delivered righteous lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented in his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. And that just really, <laughs> I don't know, it just really spoke to me. Not I I don't can like yeah, I it's yeah. It definitely ties yeah. in really well to the like so. the entire topic. Yeah, it it, it it's, it's uh, it almost ties in so well that it's almost like a slap in the face like here's your sign and it yeah. just leaves you it leaves you like speechless because it's so blatantly obvious like it's exactly what's mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah i think also that verse 19 is a great description of the pharisees which you know mm -hmm. we did just read interact interacted with jesus by you know saying his spirit was one of satan which yes. is, it's really true because they promise the people around them freedom. They try to act like they're, you know, here to um, spread the grace and freedom of God. But in reality, they're slaves to their practices and their, you know, their legalism and all of that stuff. Yep. I mean, I mean, look at you. <laughs> oh, man. Like. They, they 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 witness Jesus doing these miracles. They wow. see people's lives changed. They see the hand of God at work. And what do they say? They say, this isn't of God. This is of Satan. <laughs> like, yeah, it's terrifying. And at the same. Yeah. But like, it's ter it's terrifying for me personally, just because I'm seeing even that today where they talk about the things that we the things that God condemns. You know, and you can go back and you can read Romans. We could go back and read Romans 1 if we wanted to, which we're almost out of time. So I, but if you guys want to ever go back and read Romans 1 again, they talk about the things that they condone, like the things that are evil become good and the things that are good, get they say are evil. Yes. And there's so much of that, you know, and it's just, mm -hmm. oh my goodness. And it gets thrust down our throats and, and it's, <laughs> it's, my... <laughs> it's depressing. My... But at the same time, when you read scripture like this, it also gives me hope. Because Absolutely. The, nothing is new under the sun. History repeats itself. 
And it gives me hope knowing mm-hmm. that one, God is in control and, and that he knows what he's talking about, that none of this is new, you know, but in the end, God will win, you know, like this is, he, he already, you know, he, Jesus already won when he died on the cross, you know, but like just seeing things like this come alive in scripture and how so applicable it is to mm-hmm. us to this day, you know, like it's, it doesn't matter how old this book is it's still so applicable and i find so much hope in that absolutely the verse in romans 1 where it says they exchange the truth about god for a lie especially like really gets me on that one because i think essentially that's like the most condensed statement you can get on what exactly the blasphemy of the holy spirit is because in all honesty like it's taking the very being that embodies that truth that can change you with it and you're exchanging it for a lie mm-hmm. well it goes back to the original sin did god really say when you call god a liar right. <laughs> like exactly. when you call god a liar it's like <laughs> yeah humanity always goes wrong when we decide to make our own definition of morality We also see that in religion, too, you know, like we try to pursue our own morality instead of looking at what God's morality is, just like in the garden, just different fonts, I suppose. (laughs) I still remember because I did go I did go to high school for uh, my junior and senior year. But before that, I was homeschooled for a majority Mm -hmm. of my high school year. But when I got to college, I still remember when I went, I took a class in sociology and my sociology teacher basically said, I mean, this literally were the words that came out of her mouth. She said, while people may argue about what God is or who God is, the only thing that we know for certain for true when it comes to civilization is that society is God because society dictates morals. Oh, and I was like, no. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> But honestly, like, I can't say that that really surprises me because, like, if we look at even the riots happening about abortion right now, like, the whole reason this is even, like, on the table for these people is because morality is not constant for them. It's flexible. It changes. They don't have, like, a solid marker for it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we are living in a day and age now where morality is turned by how many likes you get on Reddit yep as opposed to <laughs> unfortunately what's actually, as opposed to what is truth yep it's mob rule well it's just like in romans 1 mm-hmm. and in here what they do is they directly defy god's word and then they encourage others to do it not only is it good yeah. enough you know we've moved away from i still remember the days of moral relativism where it's like it's all right for you if that's if that's cool with you that's fine just don't tell me yeah. what to do. you know that's cool man mm-hmm. and like those days are actually over now. Like I was actually talking to my dad oh, about yeah. this and it's like, we're heading, we're heading towards persecution because the days yes. of world rel- relativism are over. Like now it's no longer, if that's cool for you, cool, you know, whatever you, you, you believe what you want mm-hmm. to believe. No, it's now you side with us or you're a freaking neo-Nazi. You know yep. what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> it's so yeah. scary. It's such a scary Definitely. thing. But the, the, thing t- the thing that I've actually been noticing recently is, uh, yeah, never mind. That's never mind. Yeah, never mind. I will talk about it after the Bible study. <laughs> right. I was about. To we got we got one minute. We got one minute left here, but we can go on just a little bit farther. And for anyone else who has something they want to say, um, you know, Scribe's been quiet. Is there anything Scribe that you'd like to add to this, or Kessa, or JB, football, or HD? <laughs> I'm just you guys listening. been doing you guys been fun you've been doing all right anything that i had was not on topic i wanted to let you guys go yeah i have to say that much about the uh unforgivable sin that when i was a newborn i, I was really scared of it as well and i wasn't that really? young because this happened after my 30s when i i was born again so mm-hmm. it is okay. a huge deal for a newborn christian in my opinion as well yes yeah absolutely I definitely see the most, um, like, unease about the topic with new Christians because 
I mean, even I, when I first got saved, like that was like a huge source of like fear for me. And I think that if there was just more like clear teaching on that, it would really help like the new believers a lot more. All right. Um, well, anyone anyone else want to comment, or anyone else have anything they'd like to share about it? Anything that stuck out to you from either Second Peter or or going back to Luke? Just as a vivid vocabulary. Oh, I'm sorry. What did you say, Cass? Sorry, who's my lag? I'm always uh, two oh. seconds behind, so I tend to talk over people without intending no, you're to. Good. Um, just the vocabulary of Second Peter is so. Um, I don't know if colorful is the right word, but it's certainly a zoo of descriptions. Mm-hmm. very visual absolutely well if there's nothing else anyone wants to share um then I guess we can close in prayer.